called Sammy Lee West, better known as P. Wee. Welcome to BCTV tonight. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to have a man with your caliber in all your regal glory and splendor on Buffalo's Community Affairs <laughs> magazine. <laughs> Welcome to BCTV tonight, Pee Wee. Thank you, Doug. Glad to be here. Okay, Pee Wee, we're going to talk a little bit about your time here in public access, but we're also going to talk about um, your life because you've been, you've been through a lot in your life. Um, if you don't mind me asking at the risk of being rude, um, how old are you right now? Right now, I'm 60. 60 years old. When was your birthday? 5th March, 23rd, 39. Okay. Uh, well, happy belated birthday. Thank you. <laughs> you didn't tell nobody it was your birth. Maybe it was your birthday. What's wrong I, with you? I put it this way. I'm 60 years old. I ain't never had a birthday party, so I don't want that. Uh, well, we're going to see. We're going to have to change that, Pee Wee. We're going to have to change that. You deserve one. All right. Um, Pee Wee, talk to us about your early life growing up as a, growing up as a kid. Well, I was, born in, I was born in Montezuma, Georgia, at 50 miles out from Macon, Georgia. And when I was coming up, well, I put it to this way, I ain't, I ain't never seen my father. So when I was coming up, my grandfather, he was the man of the house. And I always hang around with my grandfather. My grandfather, he made moonshine. And then when he go to the liquor still, I generally go with him. He bought me a 22 rifle, and I was going squirrel hunting while he was going making the moonshine. And back in those days, that when Rebel News was walking around through woods and tearing up people's liquor still. So he told me if, he, if I see anybody, shoot the rifle, and he'll know there's a Rebel New coming. Now, I, am, I understand, am I to understand this correctly? You started drinking when you were four years old? Yep, when I was four. I didn't, what you call it, start, start off drinking like, like people that really drink. Like when I be with my grandfather, mm -hmm. I be running around there and all that. He be trying this for the revenue. He would take a little sip of that. Then I started to take a little sip, sip, sip. Then I kept going with him and I started drinking, drinking, drinking. When he give me a little cup full behind his back, I still give me a big cup full, other words, what you call a fruit jar full. Then I go out there and hide it, and when he leave, I go back there and get him started drinking. So that's where it started. Okay, uh, Pee Wee, um, how, how did you do, just out of curiosity, how did you do in school? In school, no, I didn't do that good in school because at that particular time, I was going through DDTs and all of that stuff. And, uh, and I was hooked on the alcohol. And the only thing I wanted to do is get out of school, go with my grandfather for I get my feeling back on. But and some things I did real good. Some things I did real good in. Such as? Math. They never did like spelling. Oh, I don't forget this girl named Bertha Thunder. I mean, her was cool. And then I, when I go to school, I get her all of my whack, and uh, she all, huh? No, go ahead. Go ahead. And she I'm all, saying. I give her all of my whack, and she do my homework for me. And then after that, when we get out of school, my cousin, he had a little store. I always go by that store and get her cookies and ice cream and stuff like that, cause she would do it my homework. That was your little girlfriend, wasn't it, Pee Wee? Oh, she just was a friend of mine. No, 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 and you also were a member of the uh, Black Panther Party. Right. Um, what, what came first? Was it, would, I, I assume that your prob probably your life on the street came well, first. How did you wind up turning into a life on the streets, baby? <coughs> well, 
Like like these mothers today doing their kids today. Like they be yelling at their kids saying you ain't gonna be this, you ain't gonna be that, or you put me in mind and your father ain't ain't no good. So I just got tired of hearing my mother saying that. So I started hanging out in the corner with my friend. And then hang on the corner with my friend. We play, if I do it, you do it. If a guy go do that, I'll do it. If he don't do it, then somebody else go do it. Otherwise, we're playing a game called chicken. And that's how I got involved in street life. And Talk when to I, us about the game called chicken. No, it's just like this. Okay. If we be walking down the street, most of the time we go to a store, or if I put some in my pocket, he got to put some in his pocket. Oh, okay. So when you walk out the store, you want to be number one. So he, he, if he get one thing in his pocket, I try to get two or three. So when I come out on the street, I'm more better than he is, more slicker than he is. So that's how you get your name. Oh, okay. That's how, that's what you call chicken. Oh, okay, I see, I see. Yeah. Um, talk to us about your, um your days with the uh, Black Panther Party. How'd you, how'd you first get involved with the Black Panther Party? Okay. Let's see, that was back in uh, 64. Six, 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 no, six. Uh, the Black Panther, that Black Panther, if I can help you out, the Black Panthers was started in 1966. 66, yeah. This was back in 1960, a year after that, 67. Okay. 1967. Okay. Okay, I would live at 133rd and 125th. That's in Harlem. And uh, at 120, at 227, at, at, one, at 227 7th Street, there was a little building that had the Black Panther parties on there. And then all these people's up there, they be going there, and they be telling us about the landlord. They paying uh, this much rent for the landlord, and the landlord ain't fixing the rent, and this and that. And so, he was a, a guy named Cat, and he said, well, we the Black Panther Party, don't pay no rent. When the landlord come, you tell him that you gave us the money for the rent. And so, that's what we did. So when the landlord, when the people that got more bad houses, we tell the landlord who never owned the house that they ain't gonna get no money until they fix the houses up like that. That's how we started out. And then a lot of them kids out there, most of the people on welfare, the check didn't come on time, them kids be hungry. And so we start feeding them grits and eggs and stuff. Like there was a breakfast program. But now the government took it away from us. Are there any other kind of memories or any kind of stories from your Black Panther experience that you could share with some of our viewers? Yeah. That's when uh, Bobby Seal that's when Bobby Seale was in, in Chicago 7, and uh, we went to Chicago, and uh, they wanted to get all of, us, all, of, all of us from New York City. They wouldn't let us get off the plane when we got to Chicago. So the FBI took us off the plane, put us on another plane, and took us to California. In California, he took us off the truck and took us to a place called San Quentin took us to a place called San Quentin. In San Quentin, we started yelling out our rights and all of this, you know, what you're doing, taking us to jail. You know, we ain't violating no law or nothing like that. And so he said, we'll find something for you. So in jail, they, I, they was trying to scare us. The guy took us to an electric chair and he had a, something like a half a, a half a, a half a car and he put it on the electric chair and cut the juice on it and jumped off. And he said that way, he said he, he gonna get every one of us like that. And so we didn't say nothing because we know our rights. And plus, there were some prison guards there that knowed us. And we got them for the call Bobby Seal. And Bobby Seal then called William Kessler. William Kessler was our lawyer. And he come down and got us. And the cops charged us with trespassing. And we could have we, we charged them with kidnapping because they took them from Chicago to California. You know, like we was on the plane, then we, then we, I, that, then I said, I'm scared, I said, I'm, I'm scared, I called the stewards, come here. 
I said, have this plane ever been hijacked? Whoa, man, she ran up there, thought we were hijacked the plane and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we got when we got back to Washington DC, a bunch of FBI's out there. And he said that she said that one right there. And he called me. He said, What's your name? I said, Sammy Lee West. He said, What you talking about hijacking? I asked, I said, I asked the students, have this plane ever been hijacked? I don't want to be on a plane hijacked, my man. I said, I love myself. Like that. So he told me to get off the plane, catch the train. So we had to catch the train back to New York. Then, then were some good days because out there we wasn't, like the gangs here today, killing their own brothers. Now we wasn't killing our own brothers. Black like Panthers weren't about that. No, we wasn't about no killing. Only thing we wanted to do, we wanted to protest and we wanted people's rights and stuff. Like, I forgot what year, what year it was, Red Brown, about, the name of the book was Die, Nigga, Die. In that book, it's saying that the brother gonna be killing one another, the brother gonna be in gang, the brother gonna be killing one another over drugs. And this book came out in 1966, and I read about that. And right today, it's happening out there in the streets. Brothers are killing one another over, over drugs. You know. See, I read about this before that happened. Okay. I'm going to tell you about Rat Brown. Okay. <clears throat> Rat Brown went to this store. And uh, he, somebody else in there was arguing with this woman. And this, and this lady said this guy had stuck, stuck her up about two or three months ago. And uh, and the guy that they was talking about, the guy left, and the cops come there, and got Red Brown. Guess how they identify Red Brown? By his shoe. By his shoe. No, by his toe. Say, hey, big toe. Oh, Red Brown. Oh, really? Yeah, he ran Sanders, you know, like that. They railroaded him. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, they railroaded him. So back in back in them days, man, I lacked it. But right now, what we fight it for, man, went to jail for, got beat up for, you know, kind of get our rights, our constitution right. The kids today, man, they don't even think about that. You no, know, no. they don't even think about none of that. Now, like, I hear kids on the on, on the train, buses down the street corner, man, they be out there rapping. Some of them. Know about 23 rap songs and don't even miss a beat. And yet they can't say the ABCs. And they don't, they don't know nothing about them black history. You know. Because one day I was over at, over at the train station on Utica. I said, if anybody in here tell me the bus, the name of the bus Rose Park was on, I'll give you buy your Big Mac. I didn't buy nobody nothing because they didn't buy no it. See, the name of the bus was Jim Crow bus. They didn't know it. Didn't nobody know about no black history. But I have a guy on the train, saw some of the little kids out there getting down to it. Like at Langston Hughes Center. Now I see those kids up there, those kids know their history. And I got to give it to Miss Hill and Micah Hill. Man, they really teach those kids about black history, you know. And I'm proud to see them kids when they go there and learn all of that. You know, at least I know they're getting something smart. I don't know how long they're going to keep it, but now they're getting it. And they probably carry it on with them, you know, in their life. Right. So weren't you at one time, uh, didn't you head up one of the Black Panther offices down in Harlem? Yeah, that was 122 7th Street. I had that for, for, for three years. And uh, like I said, we had an oath that we could not drink or use drugs. And me, I always did drink, but I never did use drugs. So I'd be drinking, 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 and somebody else wanted my pole, so they, so they called Bobby Seal and told Bobby Seal. Bobby Seal came in from Oakland, told me that I, you know, I had to resign because I'm letting alcohol take care of my business that I'm taking care of. No. Now, um, you had a lot of, your, your, 
well, before we get into more of your, your addiction, uh, a lot of times we would be up at uh, Channel 18 where I was formerly employed. Um, you, I remember you used to share many stories with us about how many times you went to court and uh, dealt with some judges. Would you care to share some of those stories with our viewing audience right now? <laughs> oh, see. From uh, 1972 to, to 1985, I've been in jail 49 times. These are all, these are all was drunk and disorder conduct, ref refusing quests of a police officer, calling the police a pig or something like that, yelling at him, talking about his mama and all of that. And I have went before a lot of judges. And uh and they asked me how how do I plead would I go there? I said, you know, I said I plead get through the explanation. Then that allowed me a chance to explain what I was doing, this. Most of the time I wind up getting if he said fifteen days, I was good at talking, so I'm gonna talk him down to seven days. Sometimes I get seven days. One day I got a day and a half. No, a, a day. I rolled out the window and they rolled me back the next morning. When I was coming up on Niagara Street in Georgia, right behind the city hall, and he was some good cops at Precinct 10. Most of those cops that I know, they know me, and most of them were living on 7th Street, Caroline and Busty. And so when I'd be out there doing my stuff, and uh, still they locking me up, some of them pick me up, take me home. Then I get some old dirty cops that uh, from the east side, he comes over there. When he picks me up, he take me out there by Rich State and make me get out of the car and walk back to Buffalo. Most of the time, I'd be back to Buffalo before they got here. Be, I'd be a, got me a ride. <laughs> I'd be a, got me a ride. <laughs> I always get the ride. But one day, I hope, I hope the, priest, the priest watching this. I don't know his name, but I know he's a priest and he had a grandson with him. And he got a daughter live right across the bridge in Canada. One day he picked me up and, and, I, and then he asked me where I was going. I told him I was going on Niagara Street. And he said he was going, going to Canada to visit his daughter. Since, since I was drinking, I was telling him how many times I had a relapse and all of that. And he told me where I go to Canada with him because he wanted me to talk to his daughter. I messed up on this one. I went over there, and his daughter out, they was arguing. She was drinking. So, still of me going in there, I'm telling her the story of my life, and I don't know what happened. I wind up, me and her both were drunk. You know, I suppose it's been happening out. I guess that free, free should never take me to where we have no more. <laughs> Yeah, back then, back then, it was a crazy thing that I was doing. And uh, like I hear a lot of people say they, they get drunk and they can't remember what they did. They did something crazy like that. Well, when you were dealing with your alcoholism throughout the years that you were addicted, um, were there anything, was there anything that you could remember? Yeah. Yeah. Share probably some of your experiences so the audience can get an understanding of that, of what it's like. I have a lot of blackouts, but but the thing that I I I want to remember, I couldn't remember. Okay, like I got married. My wife, his, his Moody Pugh's sister, her name was Jane and Louise Pugh. And at the time when, when I was married, I love alcohol more better than I love her. And uh, she got a job at our Hour Lady Victory Hospital, and she died of breast cancer. And I was, I was living on, this time I was living at the uh, at the hotel on corner Allen and Park, I think 
it was the Greystone Hotel. Yeah, it was the Greystone Hotel. And uh, some people come telling me the cops were looking for me. I said, for what? I ain't did nothing. Then I saw this cop, I know that's what they're looking for me. He said that my wife was in, was in Deacon Hospital and that they were looking for me, so he took me there. And my wife was dying, and she asked me to make her a promise. She said, promise me you let my mother keep my kids. Then I told her, okay, I let her you know, grandmother keep, keep the kids. Then right then she passed away. And I went out, got dead drunk. I was supposed to go to the funeral. I went to the funeral, I went to the wrong funeral. I got in a fight with a white guy. When I got to the, when I got there, there was a lot of people, the white people was there. I didn't know I was in the wrong place. Cause I was drinking, like I said, I was drinking. And this man, and the man was over the casket. And I told him I wasn't looking there and see my wife. So me and him got an argument. And what hurt me about that, right today, my kid, when they talk about it, they really hurt me. Bring back memory. Right today, I, want, I was so drunk, I don't even know where my wife was buried at. I know this, her birthday is May the 21st. My birthday is May the 21st. Then my son said, Daddy, let's go to the cemetery, clean mama's grave off. Then I always can put it off. I said, now I got something to do. I don't have nothing to do. I said, go to your grandmother. She'll take you out there. And I let, let, her, let them go to their grandmother or Moody. They take them out there. And I keep saying one of these days, I guess I got pride. I don't know. If, if I got this pride, it's hurting me. Because one of these days, I'm going to ask Moody them where she, where she buried at. You know. And that's the only thing that I, I wanted to remember and I can't. Where your, where your wife was buried at? Where my wife was buried at. Okay. Um, one of the stories that I heard about you while you, were, while you were in the midst of your alcoholism was there was a point where it got really serious and life-threatening. And I guess it had to do with you, you actually fell out of a window Yep. Tell us about that, Pee Wee. I was at Jump C. Johnson Park. I was living in Johnson Park. I was living in that hotel right there on the corner of Johnson Park. I forgot the name of it. And I was living on the third floor. And uh, <clears throat> I went to the liquor store around the corner, got me a gallon, gallon of wine, came back up. And that day it was hot, man. I raised all the wonders up in the house. It was hot. So round, this one in the kitchen, he got a little, something like a little back of the on the wonder, got a long ledge. So I was sitting in the wonder. And so I guess I laid down. I laid down. I know I was out there because I had one of my feet on the inside. And I forgot and I rolled over. I must have rolled over too far. I fell three floors. That's gonna take his guard up there. Three flags down. Yeah, when I woke up, people around me, they said, Pee Wee, Pee Wee. Oh, you know you just fill out that one. When I came to my right mind, and at that time the cops were coming there, they were asking everybody, what happened? What happened? I said, I don't know, officer, I just got out here. And it hits the guard up there. I know that. And I didn't even hurt myself neither. You know, I see his guard up there. I believe so. I believe you're right. Yeah. In 1987, you were admitted into uh, ECMC. Can you tell us why you were admitted in there and um, what the doctors found wrong with you at that time? Okay. I don't call it no name. Okay. There was a bootlegger. And, uh, Every time I go home, sometimes, this time I went home, I was dead drunk. His door was open. I think he was in the bedroom sleep. And he had 
three cases of whiskey, about six cases of wine. I stole three cases of whiskey, took it upstairs. I came back down, I stole three cases of wine and took it upstairs. And I went upstairs, I locked my door, and I just stayed there drinking, drinking, drinking. So I drunk, I drunk a pancreas, a hole in my pancreas. And uh, I was so weak, and uh, I, I couldn't even open my door. And uh, I had a telephone. They did have to cut that off because I was drinking my money but wasn't paying my phone bill. And so I finally got enough strength. And I took a wine bottle and I threw it out the one that broke the glass. And some guy, and so I remember somebody yelled, Pee Wee, what's wrong with you, man? Then I yelled, Call me an ambulance. And so they called me an ambulance, so they took me to every kind of medicine. And when I got there, I told, I'll never forget his name. His name was Dr. Bishop. Then I, when he came to me, I said, Dr. Bishop, I said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I said, I'm having dynamic pains. I ain't never had no pains like this before. You know, oh yeah, let me tell you what, what I did bef before I went to the hospital. It was some friends of mine, they do drugs. And so they came to my house, they were gonna shoot up. So they asked me what's wrong with me. I told the guy, I said, I don't know, man. I said, my stomach hurt me, man, and these pains killing me. They gave me, they shot me up with some drugs. That, with all the drugs they shot me up with, that didn't stop the pain. So they said, man, if this drug don't stop the pain, I don't know what's wrong with you. Yeah, that's when after that, they went home that night. So that night I got sick, now that's when I broke out the one. And when I got there, the doc, I told the doctor that I'm having these dynamic pains. And he told me, said when they checked my blood pressure, that uh, my blood was white. I didn't have no red blood in me. And, uh, they can't operate on me till my, till the, till my blood or something to come down. And I told him, I said, I don't care what happened, Doc. I said, I don't care if my blood is yellow or green. I said, will you please stop these pains because these pains are killing me. So I don't know what they did. They gave me some stuff, some stuff, and they took me to the x-ray room. And uh, now this, I don't know what happened, but this is what the doctor and my mother-in-law told me. When I woke up in the recovery room, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law is never cute. And uh, when I woke up and I asked her, I said, what you doing down here? Cause when I went to the hospital, I didn't give nobody no names or nothing like that. And Sarah, and Sarah, she wakes at the hospital. She must have told her mother that I was in the hospital. Say, so the doctor called us up and told us to come, come to identify your, your body. Then when she said that, and then she said, God must have got something for you to do. And right then I had all them tools in me. I got down to bed, I said, Lord, I said, I said, you know my problem. I said, you, I said, you know I've been lying to you all, all my life. Every time I said something, Lord, I would be lying, lying. I said, but this time I'm not lying. I said, if you help me get out of this hospital, I would tell the kid what alcoholic drugs and games did to me. After that day, I got 16 years sobriety, but I got it by becoming a TV producer. Oh, yeah. And when the doctor came there, I told the doctor. I said, doctor, I said, thank you for saving my life. He's a, he's a salmon. He said, we lost you three times and we were taking you, we were taking you to the mall when you move. He said, don't never thank me. Cause you know, a doctor can't say God. So you better thank somebody up there. So don't never thank me. So I did not say your life. Somebody else say your life. So you thanked him. And ever since then, I had a drink now in 16 years. 16 years of sobriety. 16 years of sobriety. Congratulations. We hope you have many more. Thank you, Doug. Now, in the aftermath of 
in the midst of your sobriety. In 1992, you founded and served as president of the Westside Junior Neighborhood Advisory Council, organized under the Community Action Organization of Erie County Incorporated. Now, talk to us about that. <coughs> okay. I was living in Lakeview Projects, and in CEO over there, and I was helping, I was helping Pearl McGee, because she was supervisor of the CAO over there in Lakeview Project. And so I had a job then up at the laundry mat in Lakeview Project. And so I left the CAO and I went up to the laundry mat, we were going to clean it up. And this little kid, he come running up to me and said, Pee Wee, so my VCR broke. He said, do you have a VCR? Let me look at my VCR. Then, then right then, all the stuff hit me, some all sorts of questions jumped right in my mind. Okay, at 1315 Pennsylvania, there's a center there, and don't nobody, those kids that don't go to school, don't, don't they'd be out there playing by themselves, and so I went and told, I went, no, I went, I went and told Ms. Florence Ball. <clears throat> she's the director of the neighborhood service the CAO at Seven Harbor Place. I was Ms. Ball. I said, you know what I, I was thinking about? I said, you know like those kids that don't go to school? I said, what about let me open up a, open up a center over there in Lakeview Project? And that way the kids can come, come there, the one that don't go to school. And they can stay there until the one that get out of school, the one that get out of school, they can come there. So that worked for a little while. Senior citizen over there, they didn't, at that time, they didn't, they didn't like it. Cause the kids be playing music live, and the kids don't go home till around about 10 o'clock, like that. So they just made, they just, they just, they just did a lot, a lot of complaints. And right today, I'm not bragging, but I got over 89 markets, stores that donate to the West Side Junior NAC. Then I take it to the kids on the West Side. Sometimes I, t I take it all over the East Side too. Like when I go over there, and that, when there's a Pee Wee, you got any goodness? Oh yeah, my man out here in Central Park Plaza, I go there and get all the donuts I want. One of bread, I can name a thousand. All the top markets, McDonald's. I go out to any place and get get anything I want for a kid. You know that way most of the kids don't have to buy nothing. Wow, they be donating to me. No kid let to see me coming. Come and think about it. See all those cookers there? Oh, I see them. They're all around the room. Yeah, I got I got this, this Carlson upstairs. She bought me some ice cream. I got to take that over there today. As, as I get through your interview, I'm going to take that over there. So, Pee Wee, let us now move into the realm of public access television, Channel 18. For starters, uh, how did you first hear about Channel 18 and um, what, made you, what inspired you to get involved? Okay. A letter came in mail at the CAO, and it came to Ms. Florence Ball Department, Neighborhood Service Department. And so I was in there talking, talking to Ms. Ball. Ms. Ball asked me what kind of hobby I had to keep me occupied. You know, that, you know when I'm not with the kids. I told her right then, I said, I didn't have no hobby, but I won't get me one. And she gave me this piece of paper saying BCTV and asked me what come on, check that out. So I said, so go there, start it. So go there and sign up for it. Start taking pictures out there. That'd be a hobby. So I did it. I went up there, started dying. Talk to us about some of the people that you. Uh, what was it? What was it like? Well, what was it like being there for your 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 early period at Channel 18, the public access channel in Buffalo? Well, I look at it this way: sister from the streets. I, I see. A, I saw a power. A power thing there. The people that worked there seemed like 
is it two, one person working this position, seems like they want more power than the next person. That next person sitting over there, he knows that they want more power. Like my man Kevin. Yeah, Lord, Lord. Kev, I got. I hate to say this, but I'd call Kevin a dog. But the way he talked to people, you know. And going back to think about what Kevin was telling me, what he told me in a, in a yelling in a yelling way, he always yell. But most of the thing he was telling me, I seen now. It came true, but yet he didn't see it to make me feel happy. He said it in an angry way, so I didn't like that, and I didn't didn't want to listen to him. And uh, hit about three people up there. Oh, I, I got to say, Michelle, she had a little bad luck, but she was all right. Doug Russell, you you was all right. Thank you. Jimmy, he was all right. Carl, he was all right. And and the other people coming down, most of them were producers. Okay. Um. Talk to us about some of the shows that you produce on Channel 18. Oh. oh. Okay. Every Monday at 8.30, this jazz for you. From 8.30 to 9.30, this jazz for you. Every Monday at 10 o'clock, a message of hope. That's for, that for my Puerto Rican friends. He's a Spanish, he's a Spanish preacher. Every, two, every Tuesday at 8.30, the Africa Globe family. Every Friday, this is my heart. Every Friday, 15 minutes of fame and fortune. Every Saturday, at 1.30, quality designer. That's when this guy do bathroom, bathroom designer. That's a lot of shows there, Pee Wee. Six shows. Six shows. <coughs> well, I was going to ask you, I had a question about that, but before I ask that question, you, you mentioned that um, one of those shows, uh, 15 Minutes of Fame and Fortune, was your heart. And um, why, is, why would that show out of, all the, out of the other five be your heart? Don't get me wrong. Now, I love my other show, but 15 Minutes of Fame and Fortune because uh, how I got that name. Cause I like to be standing on the corner talking with my friends, and one day I said, everybody deserves their 15 Minutes of Fame and Fortune. So one day they don't give you your 15 Minutes of Fame, and that stayed in my mind. That show, like I go out in the community, I do a lot of, a lot of taping for that, and a lot of kids, we want to watch that show and want to be on that show. And so, other words, most of the time, like, when I produce, I be out in the community. But like in the winter time, something like that, they, a lot of, they I get let a lot of kids be on it. But most of the time, I be out in the community taking it. I just love that show. That was my first show. Yeah, and I, can, I must say that um, you have a very large, even when I started working in public <laughs> access, you have a known reputation for being all over the place. There's not a place that you can go, that, that a person can't go without seeing Pee Wee there with his camera. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, see, I, I dare, okay, well, I will put this on channel two, channel four, channel seven. And when they go, when, when they go in the black community, the only goal there was a murder, rape, that's it. The only two things they go there for. And like the gangs down there, they go for that with somebody getting killed. They never go down there like, like, like when they're giving out something, you know, like that. If they go down there, they only show it for about, I think, 15 seconds. Probably not that long. But when I go down there, I show it for an hour. Then people see themselves on TV, then a lot of people just be coming home and said, Pee Wee, I heard I was on TV. Will you, will you please show that show again? I rerun it sometime again. And I like that show. That's good. That's good. Now, I took note of something. You got a lot of shows on, on Channel 18, brother. 
How okay. did that happen? Okay. How you wind up? How'd you luck out and get six shows? Who said you could have six shows on Channel 18? Okay. Mr. Pee Wee. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what my grandfather told me. My grandfather said, as soon as you want anything in life, you got the wet foot. When you wet foot, it's yours, and you don't give it away to nobody. So I work hard in the community for those shows. Then I wasn't going to give it away to nobody. And uh, do I have a problem with, with Robert Butler? Yes, I do. Sure have a big problem with her. Okay, um, since, since I'm sorry to cut you off, but no. since we mentioned that, let me just segue you into that right quick. Um, in uh, earlier, around the middle of this year, middle of 1999 this year, um, Channel 18 went on, underwent a uh, management change. It switched from BCTV over to its brand new operator, BNN, Buffalo Neighborhood Network, of which I was the former operations director. I resigned as of July 28th. But um, from a producer's standpoint, talk about your views on Buffalo Neighborhood Network. Okay. Like I said, we got a new director. Her name is Robert Butler. Some people say she's a uh, squeaky wheel. I call it slick wheel, you know, like that. And when she came there, she came there in the wrong, in a, in, in the wrong pose. She didn't let nobody there, no, no producers, know that she was over that. See, the best thing she did when the people down, Jane Pitts and them downtown, Terry Packy, all of them down there, when they gave her the contract, it ain't too late. If y'all out there want to take over, I heard that our Don Allen want to do it. You should get it. And when she came there, she should have, she should have wrote all the producers, well, put a, I said, well, put a bulletin board up. And said that all the producers that she gonna have a meeting, come there, introduce herself. herself. So I'm Robert Butler, I'm y'all new director. And uh, I'm taking over this place. And I hope we can work together. Boom, 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 boom. Like that, but she did not do that. Then she turns around. <coughs> came in there with attitude. Saying that it, all the producers gonna have one TV show. And I knew I wasn't going for that. Yeah, I remember you did a uh, show which said you're not giving up uh, none of your TV no, shows. I didn't. I didn't give up now, neither. Like she gonna say. Now, the people that she got from Squeaky Wheel, she bring them over there. She got her own board. When she came there, she came there with seven people. And then she gonna bring them other producers from Squeaky Wheel that she don't promise and gonna come over there at BNN TV, I'm gonna tell me and give up one of my show, the woman's stone crazy. Okay, then she turned around, she was putting on the stream that our new producer who wanna do, who wanna show, their own show, do this right here, come in, do all this right here. When she didn't sit down there and tell the people that the money wasn't in yet, we don't have no new machine, the old machine is out of style. They broke. They're not fixed. 150 people come there, took the class, went through with the class. Another 150 came there, took the class, went through the class. Now they outside, mad as hell. When are we going to get our stuff? When are we going to get our stuff? Yeah, would you, could you tell, I mean, you went, you, these were, they, they, they were orient, being in orientations for yeah. the producers. Why don't you talk to us, enlighten us as to um, what was it like when you went to the orientation? What was it like for you? What was your impression from the orientations? I didn't like it. Why? It, it, it wasn't did right. Doug, when I like this, like I said, if she didn't do the director, she should have come there and got all the producers there. She said, okay, I'm getting all the now y'all know we don't have no equipment, but y'all producers, when y'all be out there doing y'all thing, taping y'all shows, could you take two people with you, show them the rope? 
That's all she had to say. You know, like I said, yeah, I said, I'm going to shoot tomorrow. You want to go? I got to take about two or three people with me. But she didn't do that. But now, like I said, all them people standing outside, they mad. And they wonder where's the, where's the equipment at. She ain't said nothing to the people. Don't even talk to them. We have meetings. She don't never come to the meeting. You know. These would be the meetings of the Buffalo Independent Producers Guild. Right. And what have, what have those meetings for the Producers Guild been like? I'm going to tell you the truth, Doug. Same old, same old with me. Same old, same old with me. Yet, we have all the meetings, look how long it's been. We still ain't sent nobody to the board yet. Every time we go to a meeting, it's this and that, this and that, this and that. But, my opinion, I might be wrong. No, I know I'm not wrong. I know I'm right. We got to get everything new. We got to get a new president. Somebody got to do something. Look how long it's been. We ain't got nobody on the board yet. See? And what the same thing out here now, it's an argument. When you go to the meeting, oh man, that was man, that was when y'all first come here. Oh man, we heard that at the other meeting. Oh man, we heard that at the other meeting. Man, we don't want to hear that, man. When we gonna do something? When we gonna send somebody to the board? Ain't nobody got to the board yet. That's it. You no. Know. Okay. Um. So, are you, have you tried to get yourself on the uh, board of directors for Buffalo Neighborhood Network or in a leadership role with the uh, Independent Producers Guild? I. I won't. I wanted to one time, but like uh, I won't, it won't make no sense for me to go down there. Cause I be going to jail. Call. Why do you say that? <laughs> because me and Robert, me, me and Robert Butler, when she come kind of take my show, I, I've been upset over that. And and the way she do the producer, I'm, I'm, I'm upset over that. Cause if I go down there, and I get on the board, I go down there. I'm, I'm gonna see. I'm, if I demand something, I want it. See, if I go out there, if I demand something, I want it. And speaking of demanding and getting what you want, uh, I understand that a resolution was passed in terms of uh, grandfathering uh, pr programs on Channel 18, and those who have more than one show were able to keep that show. Could you tell us about that? Right. Like I said, I wanted, I wanted my show when we went to the, to the meeting at the City Hall. I told old people exactly where I was coming from, that Robert Butler wanted me to give up one of them, wanted me to give up all of my shows but one, and I work too hard in the community. I'm not, I'm not gonna give up my shows. I'm a producer, like I'm producing shows for the public. Like I got six shows, I produce those shows for the public pleasures, not mine, for the public pleasure. And she gonna come tell me I don't have to give up one of my shows. With that, with that grandfather thing, I got that law passed. And all the producers out there, if you got one show, keep it. Got two shows, three shows, or four shows, or six shows, you keep your own show. There's only newcomers, the new producers. When they come in there, they got to have one show, one show, one show. No. And are you sure this is not going to make a conflict with new producers? I mean, if somebody has like six shows or another person has ten shows, and do, don't you think at some point that'll make it difficult, that might at some point make it difficult for a new producer that wants to get a show on because of the limited broadcast hours that they have right now? Nope. Nope, I don't think so. Why is that? Because, number one, when BC, they, got, they, don't, uh, they don't know nothing about the federal government. When BC first signed that contract, they probably were so happy to get the money and the man asked how long do they, they want the hours. They first jumped up from, from a 12 into 11 at night. How many hours is that, seven? That's the only thing they asked for. Now, all they got to do now, Robert Butler, she got in sense. If you don't know what to do, ask me, I'll show you how to do it. Go back to, go back to the government, tell them that she got about 300, new producers, and they can keep the station open 24 hours. 
if the government said that, if you could keep that station over 24 hours, that's exactly what the government needs. It's a public access channel. That's for the public. Long the public going to watch that station, the government will put money into it. But she did not ask for no 24 hours. She only asked for seven hours from 12 to 11 at night. So that's on the government give her. If I walk up to you, just a dub. No, give me a dollar. You give me a dollar. I said, oh, dub, I'm sorry, man, I made a mistake. Give me five. You said, no, you asked me for one. You better keep that or give it back to me. That's the same thing with her. It's a good point. It's a good no. point. So later on, you know that next year there's going to be um, the opening of the Apollo Theater. They're in the process of completing the construction on that as we speak, and um, I believe they're going to be opening that at the beginning of next year. What are your views for the um, on the this brand new Apollo Theater facility and the future of public access in Buffalo? When they laid it on the piece of paper, sign good, look good. Smell bad. They said it's supposed to be ready in November. It's not going to be ready in November. It's going to be ready next year. They didn't tell nobody that. Everybody going, we'll be there for Christmas. We'll be there for Christmas. We ain't going to be there for Christmas. You know, that's it. We ain't going to be there for Christmas. And uh, to the kind of speaking, since it's, a, it's in the black community, they're going to throw that thing up as fast as they can. They're not going to put it up right. The first rainfall come, hard rain come, all the water going to be on the inside. Probably when the first heavy snowfall comes, snow going to come through the, the roof. I believe they're building it too fast. If they come there and say, look here, give us two years, we'll have it. When they, when they start talking about this in June or August, no. They start talking about this, I think, I think in April. They're going to put that from April into to November. They're going to build that thing that quick? No, no way in the world. No way in the world. Uh, Have you been down there and looked at it? Um, I drove by it a few times. I haven't really taken the time to really take a look at it. Look from the street. You can look up there. You still can see holes in it. Okay. Here in the roof. Okay. So um, I understand you were the recipient of many, many awards. Uh, one award in particular, and most recently, was presented to you at the uh, annual Pine Grill reunion. How did it feel to get a... Uh, uh, hey, yeah. Pine Grill reunion. <laughs> Pine Grill there reunion. There you go. That's one of your, that's one of your uh, spots, ain't it? Yeah, Pine Grill All reunion. All right, so uh, <coughs> talk to us about some of the awards that you've received over the years. Okay. The one I received at the Pine Grill reunion... I'd like to say to Mr. Don Allen, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful Don Allen, I probably would never got it. Quite naturally, when you sign a award, the mayor got to put his name down there. I mean, the mayor's cool too, but uh, Don Allen really pushed that reward for me. And I'd like to say, Don, I really appreciate that. And uh, some of the awards up there. See that Jesse Brash Award right there? I'm the first person that ever won that award that came from the streets. They would never get that award so nobody came from the streets. And I liked it that one. And the second one I like. No, that's the first one. No, that's the second one. And the third one I like is, is the one that I won at the Pine, and they gave to me at the Pine River Union. The first one I like, my heart, got me here today. When I first did, Six months with no drinking, and they gave me they gave they gave me a certificate for not drinking nothing. Six months. Now that one, I love that one. Oh, that was the first one. What's the What's the name of that award? I think it name uh, group. Group, we'll find group, it. We'll, yeah, group one recovery. We'll, we'll we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're showing it on the screen, so don't worry about it. Yeah, group, group one recovery. That's okay. Um, I I'm looking at some, uh, you got your 15 minutes of fame and fortune, channel 18 BCTV. On either side of it, you up here taking some pictures with politicians. You got a uh, George K. Arthur on one side, and you got a uh, James Pitts on the other. I understand you guys, are, you and James Pitts are pretty good friends. Talk to us about your boy James Pitts. <laughs> yeah, me and him cool. Me and him cool. 
James. I know you talk a whole lot about him. Yeah, James. James. James he's, he's cool with me, but I just hope he's cool with the public out there on election day. You know. George Austin. He's he all right. He all he always there. You know, he always comes here. He, we talks a lot. You know, he the one that got uh, like the Pine Grove reunion. Like I started videotaping that for them every year. Then I forgot his name. You you, you got something to do with this, Mr. Brown and the Marcus other, Brown. Yeah. And what other guy? Uh, Johnny B. Wise son. What the other guy name? Uh, Fred Foster. Fred Foster. And you. I'll be waiting for y'all next year. Oh, at Juneteenth. At Juneteenth. All right. We look yeah. to see you there. I'll be looking at the Juneteenth. All right. Um, tell us about your your neighborhood. I understand we are I'll be driving giving you rides home sometime over at the uh, West West Side Lakeview Projects, and I'd like you the mayor over there, man. You get much love over Wait, in that. Wait, I, I ain't cut you off before you say that. Oh yeah, for the Juneteenth. Remember this. His name is Doug. Doug Russell. I, he put your, his name on the stream. For next year, will y'all please volunteer? Because he's going to be bigger than ever this year, okay? Yeah. Will y'all please volunteer? All right? Oh, the West Side. <clears throat> well. What are you, like the mayor of that neighborhood or something, Pee Wee? No, nah, I've been there all my life, this spot. I came there in 1953. And when I moved there, there were two black families there. I was living on 7th Street in Georgia. It was another black family living on uh, Trenton. I think that Court Street, Clinton and Court Street. Yep. And then when I was living there, okay, on 7th in Georgia, right across the street, it's a fish market. On this side of the store right over here was a Puerto Rican store. Right behind me was Frontier Grocery Store. Next to that, it was a hardware. Next to that, that was a uh, Busty. It was a Italian cleaner there. Cross the street, Mayflower. Down across the street was another Puerto Rican store. Over on the right was a Greek bar. Down by Clinton, there was another Greek store. And back then, when I go to when I go to a store, if I go to an Italian store, they talk to me in Italian. They say, "Say this in Italian. Say this in Italian." And I say this in Italian. Then I say, you say this in English, like we be trading words. Then when I go to the Puerto Rican store, he says, "Say it." He says, "No, Pee Wee, say this in. That means cigarettes. Say this, Pee Wee, and like that." Then were the good old days back over there then. And like down, I forgot the name of that school, right down 7th Street. And down further, it was a steam house. Then, then were the gangster days. There was a lot of underworld mafia. They be going there taking, taking steam showers. Okay. Um some time over at the uh, West, West Side Lakeview Projects, and he'd like you the mayor over there, man. You get much love over Wait, in that, I, over I ain't cut you off before you say that. Oh, yeah, for the Juneteenth, remember this. His name is Doug, Doug Russell. I, I, he'll put your, his name on the stream. For next year, will y'all please volunteer? Because he's going to be bigger than ever this year, okay? Yeah. Will y'all please volunteer? All right? Oh, the West Side... <clears throat> Well, what are you like the mayor of that neighborhood or something, Pee Wee? No, nah, I've been there all my life. This spot. I came there in 1953, and when I moved there, it was two black families there. I was living on Seventh Street in Georgia. It was another black family living on uh, Trenton. I think that Court Street, Clinton, and Court Street. Yep, and then. When I was living there, okay, on 7th in Georgia, right across the street, it's a fish market. On this side of the store right over here was a Puerto Rican store. Right behind me was Frontier 
grocery store. Next to that, it was a hardware. Next to that, that was a uh, busty. It was a Italian cleaner there. Cross the street, Mayflower. Down across the street was another Puerto Rican store. Over on the right was a Greek bar. Down by Clinton, there was another Greek store. And back then, when I go to when I go to a store, if I go to an Italian store, they talk to me in Italian. They say, "Say this in Italian. Say this in Italian." And I say this in Italian. Then I say, you say this in English, like we be trading words. Then when I go to the Puerto Rican store, he says, "Say this. He said, "No, Pee Wee, say this in. That means cigarettes. Say this, Pee Wee, and like that." Then were the good old days back over there then. And like down, I forgot the name of that school, right down 7th Street. And down further, it was a steam house. Then, then were the gangster days. There was a lot of underworld mafia. They be going there taking, taking steam showers. Okay. Um I understand that uh, you were a part of a uh, a book called uh, Triptychs with uh, photographs by Milton Rigovin. Talk to us about how how'd you uh, talk talks about uh, Buffalo's Lower West Side Revisited. Uh, talk to us about that. Oh, I was in our two of his book. The first book, it was the Lower West Side, and the second book, Triptych. And uh, I forgot that he did now. This guy named Char Char Rowe. He used to do CBS Sunday. He came. He came to Buffalo and put me on TV. I was on. I was on CBS Sunday. Sun, is that Sunday morning? Yeah, Charles Carroll. Yeah, you're C- about. I was on that on CBS Sunday morning. And then, over 20 or 30 years, I've been knowing Milton. You know, when I first met Milton, I was on the corner of Carolina and Whitney. And I was standing up, I was standing, I think, no, no, you got a picture with it. Yeah, we'll have it. Oh, this picture right there, picture right there. Okay. I was looking at oh, the door. And I haven't, I went on the store open, open up and I, I haven't looked across the street. And I, I saw this man and this little old lady out there taking pictures. He asked me, can I take your picture? Then I said, I, then I said, what happened to the first one? He said, I ain't never took your, your picture before. I said, all you FBI say that. I thought it was the couple cops or something like that. I said, all you FBI say that. And then after that, we we were meeting one another, sharing one another ideas and all of that. And that's how he did that book behind you. Like some of the words in there, he would, he wanted to know about about the West Side when, when okay. When I, like I said, when I lived on on uh, Self Street in Georgia, Pine Harbor wasn't there. They tore up my house down and put Pine Harbor there. Shorelines wasn't there. And back in them days, it was something like Little Italy. Most of that was but was, was, was Italian. And most of them was old. They talk talk. They didn't speak no English. Just all Italian. And it was something like like Little Italy. And I know all of those people on the streets, they know me. And he would ask me, how did I feel when they, you know, tore our houses down, what the other people think. I would tell you what some of them told me. And so he liked the way I was talking. So he asked me, could he write a book with me being in it? I told him, yeah. Then after that, and then he, that's, the, that's the first one, the Lower West Side. Then after that, he did tripping. Then after that, at our buff state, he did a picture out there with me in it, and people came from uh, California to do to taping of me and him. And after that, I forgot this girl. I think you got the paper over there. She from England. They came from England, and I made a videotape for them, and they wrote me up in the newspaper over to England. They asked me did I want to come over there. They gonna send for me. So that's one of the days I might go over there. Okay, well, Pee Wee, this has been a pleasure.
to have you on BCTV tonight. I know it took a long time for us to get you on here, but eventually we got you on here. And it was great sitting down talking with you. I want you to, I would like for you to uh, keep your six shows. Right. Make You can make about 20 more. Right. Take up the whole channel if you want to. Right. I'd like to say something about you too, Doug. Okay. I'm not saying this because we friends or nothing like that. If I didn't like you, I'd tell you I didn't like you. But when you was there, I liked the way you took care of yourself, the way you took care of the business there. And I, and I know a lot of producers up there, they miss you. They always talk about people, man, if Doug was here, man, we don't know. Like right now, man, all the books and everything up there messed up, man. Honest to God, I don't know what's coming to Doug. And they got people on playback. They don't know what they done up there. Then the, when the people, when the public see the, your show, then they say, what you do that for? It's not my fault if the people's on playback. And next week, I'm going to do a tape. They're going to put their number up there, you know. And right now, one guy got a show on, on up there. You can call in, but when something happens to your show, it seems like there ain't no phone up there. So it's all messed up. So y'all going to have to hold in there till Apollo Theater get ready. That's the only thing I can say. Well, Pee Wee, I'd like to thank you for your support. And I'd always like to think that there's always hope. Maybe. It's been a pleasure having you on BCTV tonight. Thank you, Doug. All right. All right.